you know, the topic was business first, you know, and I thought about business, we started with all the business stuff. So we, we kind of got you all comfortable and, you know, all the sort of good stuff, and then now I'm going to scare the heebie jeebies out. <laughs> Again, I don't mean to, but unfortunately, we live in a world where, you know, everyone's taking the blue pill, and we're the only guy who seems to be taking the red pill. So again, uh, you know, uh, I must tell you that uh, that this presentation was first done uh, at the State Street seminar, and again, Ash was uh, instrumental in uh, allowing us to sort of showcase our uh, <coughs> our thought processes at that seminar. And uh, so obviously, it's uh, you know, it was first done in April, and uh, you know, it's uh, hopefully it's not the same thing, so it's not that dated. I'm trying to sort of refresh it all the time. But you know, let's start with 2015, and you know, let's let's sort of uh, have a look at what the consensus view is. And people think that you know, as far as U.S. is concerned, GDP is up by three percent per annum in the last quarter. We should be on a normal growth path soon. Housing is recovering. Some market prices have surpassed the prior peak. With energy independence, uh, the U.S. dollar will be strong. Keep bond yields down. Equities with the Fed's help appear to be the only game in town. In short, the theme seems to be that central bankers have helped us dodge a bullet in 2008-9 is for the history books. In other words, you know, it's once in a lifetime panic, we can forget about it, things are going to be great from going on from here. As far as China is concerned, you know, China will slow down, but GDP growth will remain at 7%, and in any case, if it goes lower, the authorities will bring on a stimulus. And I don't know if you guys have watched what happened to the Chinese market, but it actually happened to beat India in the last year. And it was it was nothing other than the fact that the Chinese government did a stimulus and hey presto you know the stock has shot up. I think I think the uh, the interesting thing I read was apparently that more uh, you know uh, accounts got open you know in that rally than they ever did in the last time. I think those people who actually looked what happened the last time around you know will actually get quite frightened about what actually is, what what comes next. And uh, as far as Europe is concerned, you know, we've obviously got Mario Draghi to do what it will take, you know, means that the ECB will unleash their QE soon. Europe will turn the corner despite German foot dragging. And as proof, Spanish yields are down from 7.5% in 2012 to 1.65%. And if you think that Spanish government bonds are worth 1.65% yield, you know, then, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what you're smoking. You know. <laughs> Uh, and then, you know, we have Japan where, you know, Abe is sort of resounding election victory gives them the mandate to get Japan back on track. Abe will release his third arrow soon. Yen is sure to start going back down again, boost exported profits and boost the big time. And of course, with India, you know, and, and all of us know, you know, and especially the PMS guys, I think the consensus seems to be with the flow of reforms in the budget, the RBI forced to lower rates. And by the way, they just, you know, brought it down by 25 basis points. I wonder what's going to happen when Indian government bonds go to 1.65%. Ache din to zarur aayenge and not just for equity investors, you know, for, for everyone. Uh, so in short, you know, the do whatever it will take, central banks have our back covered and equity prices can only go onward and upward. That seems to be the sort of consensus, uh, you know, all the way around. And of course, as Mark Twain said, it ain't what you know, it ain't what you don't know that gets into trouble, it's what you know that for sure that just ain't so. And here's a good example of, you know, what you know for sure that just ain't so. And for those of you who don't know what this chart is, it's actually, uh, you know, the Euro Swiss franc. And what happened was that, you know, when the Euro Swiss franc in 2011 was, uh, you know, was actually plunging, um, the Swiss Central Bank promised everyone that they were going to hold that rate at 120. Okay, and for three years they succeeded in holding the rate at 120. And of course, everyone in the market believed that you know, I mean, the central bank has got us covered, right? So guess what? The Swiss Swiss rates are negative. You know, you you go short the Swiss franc, you go long the euro. Euro is giving you at least 0.1 basis point. Hey, what? You're getting a you're getting some carry. You know, <laughs> you're getting at least some carry. You know. And you lever it up, and guess what? You basically, if you buy it at 120, you, you can't lose, you know. And of course, everyone, it turned out everyone was wrong. The Swiss Central Bank, in an absolute shocker, basically just gave up. And the reason they gave up was that their balance sheet, which was $80 billion, went up from $80 billion to $400 billion in a matter of just two years. 
And if the Q, you know, if the ECB was going to unleash, you know, 500 billion or 1 trillion, as they now think it is, you know, they felt that okay, look, we're just going to absolutely balloon our balance sheet. We're going to completely lose control of our monetary policy and forget Switzerland. You know, it's going to be like a banana republic. You know? I mean, by the way, you know, let me tell you, the Swiss Central Bank had the fastest growing monetary growth rate of any central bank. Okay, and their loss on the amount of euros they accumulated was about, I think they say estimated between 65 billion to 80 billion, which is, you know, something like 7 or 8% of GDP. And I think, frankly, if you ask anyone, well, what does this loss mean? I think no one even has a clue. What, is, what does it mean to have a loss, you know, a central bank loss of 70 billion or whatever, you know, 7.5% uh, of GDP. So, this is what, you know, what it is really all about. And I think, you know, a lot of people, you know, haven't really understood the importance of this. And I want to stress it a little bit because I want to go back to 2007, July 2007, and when I first heard that the Bear Stearns funds, subprime funds, actually, you know, declared bankruptcy in the sense that they were wiped out, Household International, and by the way, you know, I don't know who was it that did HSBC screens, but, you know, if you remember, you know, they were actually bought Household International, and they disclosed a massive loss in Household International because they said, hey, listen, guess what? I mean, all these sort of things are just blowing up, you know. That was the time when I knew that, okay, that's it. You know, we are going to get the crisis again. And I think, again, I had a, I had a long conversation with Ash in which, you know, um, I talked about that and I said, listen, this thing has already started now, you know. And, and that was what gave me the confidence to say that it's a mistake to think that subprime is just subprime. That actually, you know, what is what has happened out here is that, uh, you know, the banks have actually extended to, you know, loans to actually completely uncreditworthy people. And once they actually start defaulting, that thing is going to go back all the way down the chain. Okay, and it took about, I think, nine months or so for everyone else to realize it. But sure enough, in nine months, I think people realize. It. And I think this is just about as important as what happened, you know, when, when Bear Stearns went past. Okay, this is actually the first time that the central bank turns out, puts their hands up, and said, "The market is bigger than we are." Okay. And 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 I think this is the first of many central banks who are actually going to turn around and say, "The market is bigger than we are." We actually, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of ladies out here, but we actually, you know. Uh, you know, sort of, I, I won't mention it, but we actually, you know, uh, had a big, big problem, you know. And I think this is going to be uh, the first sort of thing. You know, they say that, you know, the fat lady never sings at the top. Well, here's the fat lady singing. The fat lady sang in, uh, you know, in, in 2007. The fat lady singing again. This is a very, very big deal. So let's just talk about QE, you know, and I think everyone thinks, you know, again, QE is a bullet dodge. I mean, Bernanke is out there on the, uh, you know, on the news thing saying, oh, you know, QE is great, it worked, you know, we stopped ourselves, blah, blah, but it, nothing could be further from the truth. And I want to just quickly review QE. So they did QE1 in November 2008, uh, and uh, they found that, okay, it was effective in at least stopping the, you know, complete collapse in the market. They then, they then found, they then sort of, you know, had a strange kind of epiphany where they said, well, if it works, you know, in stopping the market from going completely, you know, down the tubes, then maybe it's going to work in getting our growth numbers up and getting employment up and all this kind of stuff. And I think in November 2010, they made an absolutely disastrous mistake in thinking that what works in stopping, you know, a panic also works in getting growth again, okay? And I think that was really, I mean, November 2010 is going to go down as a day in infamy, in my opinion. Uh, and then obviously, you know, when, the, when it wore off, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the market went down because of the euro in, 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 uh, in September. And then, you know, they came up with QE3 where they said, okay, it's, it's sort of, we're going to buy $85 billion per month. They started with 45 and then they upped it to 85 and they said, we're going to buy 85, uh, $85 billion a month, no matter what, uh, until such time as this whole thing gets sorted out. And I think as you guys know, in June, and September, you know, we had what, what I call the taper on taper, i.e. a reduction in buying as a prelude to the elimination of QE by fall 2014. And I think if those, those guys who look at a chart of the emerging market bond index, you know, it's very instructive because the emerging market bonds actually went down 20% within a period of two weeks. And 20%, by the way, is a big number, you know, uh, especially when I told you about all these guys who are sort of levered up on, uh, on emerging market bonds. You know, uh, you know, on the promise that, you know, well, you know, there's interest rate you're going to get for the rest of your life.
So, uh, and then we had, you know, the, the, the open market transactions in summer of 2012 and Mario Draghi made a sort of, you know, well, we'll do whatever it takes kind of um, statement. And, uh, you know, in Japan, we've had sort of, you know, August 2010, 11, and then uh, April 4, 2013, where they really came up with this sort of crazy idea that somehow cheapening your currency is a way to prosperity and wealth, you know. And, and Abenomics, by the way, is nothing other than just cheapening your currency, you know. Uh, and again, in China, has not been immune from it. You know, total social financing in China has increased by 15 trillion from 2008 to 2014. So, so from 9 trillion to 24 trillion. Just to put it in perspective, 15 trillion is the GDP of the United States. 15 trillion also happens to be the total commercial loans of the banking system in the United States. Okay, that's the kind of stimulus, so to speak, that the Chinese have done in just a spirit of sort of three years. And again, we'll just, we'll just review it, and I think this is very, very important for you to understand, is that, you know, the Fed was started in 1913. I think some of you have seen the greatest game that ever played. Well, that was in 1913, and that was when the Fed was started. And from 1913 to 2008, the Fed managed to accumulate a paltry sum of $800 billion of treasury bonds on their balance sheet, right? It took them years to accumulate $800 billion of treasury bonds on their balance sheet. But from 2008, so now, the Fed's balance sheet has gone from 800 billion to 4.5 trillion dollars. Okay, so that's a factor of more than five times in less than five years. And the point is that, you know, no one really, I mean, this has never actually ever been done in the history of the world. And to be candid, I don't think anyone really even understands what are the implications of this. Okay, but my sense is that, you know, the implications are not very good. <laughs> okay, if you increase your balance sheet by five times in a period of five years, I think the accountants amongst us will know that, well, something is definitely very screwy, you know. And again, in, in China, if you look at, you know, what has been the increase in, 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 in credit to the total in the private non-financial sector since March 2009, you know, we've had basically $11 trillion that has been actually increased, you know, in terms of credit to um, the non-financial sector. And the point is that every, anyone who knows China, you know, what's the chances that they don't have any bad debts in here, you know? I think pretty, 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 pretty much zero. And guess what the bad debts they're actually reporting? Anyone take a guess? Yeah, 1.2 percent. I mean, I think, I, I think people must be, <laughs> they must think people, people are really all on the blue pill, you know? <laughs> So, and here is an example, you know, you hear about deleveraging and all that kind of stuff, but I mean, here's the increase in the, you know, in the credit market instruments in the non-financial corporate businesses. We're not even, we're actually excluding the financial sector, right? And you'll see that, that um, 2008-9 is a little blip. I mean, you can't even, <laughs> you, you can't even sort of register it, you know. Uh, and again, you know, this, uh, the only thing that's been going, going sort of onward and upward are, you know, liabilities, okay, or credit market instruments. So what was QE intended to achieve, you know, and I, and I think, you know, it's, it's important to sort of, you know, think about, take a step back and say, well, what is QE intended to achieve? And, and QE, you know, the, the idea behind QE was it was called what's called the portfolio, ba portfolio balance channel, uh, whereby when they, when they lower interest rates, uh, it will actually induce investors to seek higher risk assets to compensate for the reduction in yield. And these lower interest rates will help boost consumption of interest sensitive goods and actually foster capital spending by corporates. And again, the low interest rates will induce the private sector, including banks, to start extending credit again. Uh, and all of this is going to jumpstart the economy, thereby reaching escape velocity and bring on a virtuous cycle of economic growth. And you know, I think. I think, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of people who sort of say that economists suffer from physics envy, you know, and I think that's, that's actually quite true, right? So, so that's why they use phrases like escape velocity, you know. I mean, what, what does escape velocity mean? I mean, it, it, I think the only time I, can, I, can, I, I heard it and it sounded credible was in Star Trek, you know. I don't know how many guys of you watch Star Trek, but, you know, there you have escape velocity, you know. You don't have any such thing as escape velocity in, a, in an economy. What has it achieved instead? Well, it's sort of encouraged moral hazard, a tendency to be more willing to take risks, knowing that the potential costs or burdens of taking such risks will be borne in whole or in part by others. Work mainly in the financial sector and raise asset prices so that the prospective return on all assets is lower than the historical required return. 
To encourage companies to issue debt and buy back equity, thus diluting financial flexibility, weakening balance sheets and hindering capital expansion. And it's actually diluted the credit structure of the economy through giving Ponzi financing units in the economy a new lease of life and creating new Ponzi financing units. And uh, here's, here's uh, Hussman, I mean, Bejna showed you what, what happened to Hussman's returns and, you know, it just happens, uh, it just so happens that he was on the wrong side of this, but, but, but basically, you know, what he was, and this was in March of 2014, that if you take a portfolio, uh, which is a standard portfolio, 20% cash, 20% corporate bonds, 20% treasury bonds, and 40% S&P 500, the prospective return on that, on that portfolio is 2% nominal in March 2014, right? And guess what? It's actually a lot worse today. It's probably about 1% or 1.5%. Uh, so, the point is that this is against, you know, as Bejnath showed you, an 8.9% required return or historical return that people have actually expected from the equity markets, you know. So, the prospective return is way below, you know, what is being the required return, at least in history. So, unless central banks have actually permanently changed the return that investors require from investing in equities or investing in bonds, the fact is that there is a big, big gap between the return they're going to get in the future and, you know, what, they're, what the return they've actually expected in equities in the past. And this is, again, the same sort of, you know, similar thing from, uh, from uh, GMO. And if you look at, you know, their real, uh, this is a real return. So you look at the seven-year real return forecast. It's minus 1.8 in U.S. large cap, minus 2.9 in U.S. small cap. Uh, U.S. high quality has come to almost zero, uh, and then international large is 1.3, international small 1.2, and of course emerging market at 3.8 percent. And the only reason why emerging market is as good as, as it is is because, but guess what? Russia is trading on sort of 1.4 times, uh, <laughs> you know, earnings or something like, or two times earnings, and Brazil is, you know, trading something similar. You know, so so you know you have some markets there that are really sort of bombed up. And again, if you look at international bonds hedge, you're talking about 3.4%, U.S. bonds minus 0.6%. Um, so actually, you know, uh, prospective returns are pretty abysmal. So wh what I want to sort of um, talk about a little is, is why is actually QE self-defeating? I mean, the, the one thing I can, you know, virtually write down and tell you that, look, you can take it as a guarantee from me, is that there's, there's, there's just no way that QE can actually work, okay? And, of course, you know, we have the policy wonk from Princeton who said the problem with QE is that it works in practice, but it doesn't work in theory, you know. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is that it actually doesn't work in theory and it doesn't work in practice, okay. And, well, why does it not work in theory? Because it actually confuses, you know, a stock effect for what is in reality a flow effect. What I mean by that is that the way QE works is that as long as the central bankers are buying bonds, the rest of the market are going to front run them, buy the bonds before they are, and they know for sure that, you know, guess what, the central banker is going to have to buy the bonds, right? So they know that, you know, I'm, I'm going to be guaranteed a profit. So it's, as long as the central bankers are going to telegraph their intentions in buying bonds, okay, people are going to go and front run them and buy the bonds and actually drive, you know, the rates up. The minute actually they stop that, you know, the flow, so to speak, it effectively means that there is actually no more a buyer of sort of last resort who's going to come in and buy those bonds, you know. So, what it really means is that, you know, the, the, the sort of, you know, the effect of QE is in getting other guys to front run you. So, that this, the central banker is literally saying, guess what, stuff me with all the sort of rubbish that, you know, you guys can accumulate and give it to me at a higher price. Again, that's exactly what, what you know, central bankers have done, you know. And, and what it does do, again, is that it lowers the prospective return below historical required return. So irrespective of growth in the economy, the natural tendency, once QE actually is halted, is for asset prices to sink lower. Only timing remains cert uncertain. Now, I think some of you guys will say, well, hang on a second. You know, the central bankers have stopped buying in o October. So why is the equity market still going up? And the answer that I have, and again, you know, uh, I mean, it's only a, a, a conjecture, is that actually what they've been very successful in doing so far is they've been very successful in actually jawboning all the market participants who are extrapolative to say that, hey, listen, you know, guess what, you know, we'll keep on talking about QE, right? So, you, you know, when the market went down 10% or more than 10% uh, in October, you know, Jim Bullard came out saying, oh, guess what, we could actually, you know, start reinstituting QE. 
And then, of course, the market rallied. And then again, the market went down 5%. And then and I think it was Charles Evans who sort of came out and said, oh, you know, I think if the market's down, we could, we could actually bring QE back on. You know, it's all data dependent. So they've actually been trying to very, very successfully keep the market uh, trying to sort of front run these assets, thinking that, you know, at any point in time, they're going to bring QE back on again. And in my opinion, you know, it's not going to be a strategy that succeeded. Again, I, I think a lot of people are not familiar because you look at just the S&P 500, but the fact is that almost every single other global market peaked out in April 2000, uh, in June of 2014. So if you look at most of the other markets, they actually put in their peaks in June of 2014. And since then, they've been actually turning down. Whether you look at emerging market bonds, you look at junk, you look at, you know, so essentially all these markets have really, in a sense, peaked out. If you look at the all world equity index, you'll find again that they, it peaked out in July of 2014. So the point is that, you know, when you lower the prospective return way below the historical required return, it doesn't matter whether you have growth in the economy or not. Again, I mean, any, anyone who thinks that, you know, growth has got anything to do with equity returns, you know, have a look at the charts, right? There's a negative correlation, by the way, you know. So it's got nothing absolutely to do with growth. So all these guys who are fixated that, you know, somehow, you know, escape velocity is going to save my, uh, you know, my, my asset prices. Again, you know, they're really, they really haven't looked at the data. The data is very clear is that, you know, uh, growth has got nothing to do with it. What, what really matters is what is, the, what, is the, what is the prospective return on that asset plot, okay? And so the prospective return, you know, as, as Bejnath has sort of uh, estimated is about 2% in, in equities and, you know, as we have sort of said, is 1.5% or so if you take a portfolio, uh, a standard portfolio, uh, and the required return has been 8.9% or 6.5%, it tells you automatically that Asset prices have to go down by almost 70%. Okay, and that's just for starters before you actually even are going to start to earn the underlying return. And I can guarantee you that if asset prices go down by 70%, they're not going to stop there. They're going to go down all the way to 90%. And by the way, anyone who tell, is telling you that, you know, you're going to stop at 30% or 50%, forget about it. We are actually going to get a 90% wipeout in almost most of the equity markets. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to prefer, prefer a time frame. I'm going to tell you it's going to happen in the next five years. Okay. I hope I'm not that, <laughs> that early because <laughs> we still have a lot of things to do before that. <laughs> but <laughs> the, the, second, the third thing is that actually it increases inequality between the top 1% and the bottom 99% and hence risks a severe backlash from the electorate. I think anyone who's been following what's been happening in, in terms of the electorate globally, you know, you'll, you'll sort of see that, that actually there has already been a severe backlash, right? I mean, I mean, people were stunned that the Republicans came in uh, and the Democrats got booted out. And I think, you know, that was actually because the electorate was pretty pissed off, you know. And it actually even happened in India. You know, people were pretty pissed off with whoever was, you know, that, that was the government in the... And the fact of the matter is that it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, all governments are actually going to be... Uh, the subject of, you know, the electorate ire because frankly, you know, uh, the electorate doesn't really figure out that, hey, hang on a second, it's actually QE that's making my life worse, right? They just think that, you know, the God, the, uh, my life is much worse than it was before and the government's not doing anything about it, you know. <laughs> okay, so the point is that the fact of the matter is that it's QE which is actually doing it because what it actually does is it actually introduces stealth inflation that, you know, um, People don't really connect with QE. And uh, finally, it actually increases systemic financial risk and increases the prospect for financial instability since the impact on Im asset prices at the margin, but the entire stock is inflated. What I mean by this is that, you know, if you think about real estate, right, there are only one or two percent transactions in real estate. And if they keep on happening at higher and higher prices, you know, it actually means that the whole stock is inflated. And why is it inflated? Because, well, say, well, okay, the last transaction took place in such and such a price. Ergo, you know, the whole, you know, all this sort of stock is, you know, at, at valued at this particular price, you know. And what it means is that you can actually go and then borrow at a much higher level and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, you don't have it in India, but, but globally, believe you me, you can go, you know, sometimes borrow. By the way, in the United States, you can borrow up to 97% 90, of the value of your home. Again, right? So after the last experience they had, they've actually figured out that, no, no, 97% is the right number, you know. <laughs> So the point is it actually inflates stock 
and, uh, and, and so it works great on the way up, but guess what? It works like a disaster on the way down, right? Because when, when, when you know, you only have one or two percent market transactions starting to happen at lower prices, that's it. The entire stock gets wiped out and all the banks, you know, are obviously overexposed and, and, and you know, have found themselves on the wrong side. So here's an interesting um, statement, right? So, you know, I, I'll read it out to you because, you know, this is, I think, quite interesting. It says, gentlemen, I too have been a close observer of the doings of the Bank of the United States. I've had men watching you for a long time and I'm convinced that you have used the funds of the bank to speculate in the breadstuffs of the country. When you won, you divided the profits amongst you and when you lost, you charged it to the bank. You tell me that if I take the deposits from the bank and annul its charter, I shall ruin 10,000 families. That may be true, gentlemen, but that is your sin. Should I let you go on, you will ruin 50,000 families and that would be my sin. You're a den of vipers and thieves. I've determined to rout you out and by the eternal, I will rout you out. And this was Andrew Jackson in 1832. So the more things change, the more they remain the same in the financial sector, right? And by the way, I think those of you who don't realize, the Federal Reserve is the third so-called central bank in the United States, okay? And it's actually, you know, because they had two failures, they didn't even want to call it a central bank. They called it the Federal Reserve System. Because the first central bank, which was, I think, the Bank of the United States, or first Bank of the United States, went bust. The second central bank, which is called Bank of the United States, actually went bust again. Okay, so this is, this is the Federal Reserve. They said, well, okay, we're not going to have a third Bank of the United States, because guess what? <laughs> that's, a, that's a deadly name to give, so we'll call it the Federal Reserve System. And the chances are, in my opinion, that no matter what name you call it, it's going to go bust as well. And here is, uh, you know, here is the, um, uh, the point that I was making again, is that, you know, this is what I call the revolt of the 99%. If you see what, that, you know, who has actually benefited from this fiat money and, you know, the fact that you've not had a gold standard is actually the 99%, right? So, Charlie Munger you know, I think is being disingenuous when he sort of doesn't say that, hang on a second, actually, guess what? You know, we're the, we the class that is actually most benefited by the fact that we don't have gold as a, uh, you know, gold exchange standard. Because the fact of the matter is that the 99% don't get a honest, honest money for, you know, what it is that they're doing, okay? And, 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 and you know, if you look at it, it's, it's literally since 1971 when, when the U.S. went off the gold standard, okay? that essentially it's only the people with assets that have actually benefited from the inflation that the um, Fed has done. And here is, you know, this, this business about the stimulus again, you know, this is a cartoon here, stimulus is like shaving, next morning you have to get up and do it all over again. And, you know, we're spending more money than we have ever spent before and it does not work. After eight years we have just as much unemployment as when we started and an enormous debt to boot. And this was Henry Morgenthau in May 3rd, 1939. And I think, you know, what a lot of people don't realize or understand is that the, actually the U.S. did try QE before. Okay, they tried it in the Depression, and in 1937, they just gave up on it. Uh, and there was absolutely a disaster in the stock market again. In 1941, U.S. stocks were cheaper on a price to uh, CAFE basis than they've ever been uh, at any point in time. Okay, so obviously the nominal no low took place in 1932. But the valuation low in the U.S. market actually took place in 1941. U.S. stocks were never as cheap as they were in 1941. And it happened when uh, basically the Federal Reserve just gave up on QE, saying that, you know, there's just no way out of here. We've got to get out. And if you think about it, the Fed is actually mortified about bringing on the same set of conditions that they did in 1937. Having done this QE, they actually do not know how to get out of it you know, without triggering a 1937-1941 type of fiasco. Okay, and that's really the crux of the reason why they're not trying to get out of it. So why is 2009 different from 98? You know, and, um, and I, I, you know, I get this thing called the King Report, and he keeps on, you know, every time, you know, you, you have something, he keeps on saying, this time it's Austria, you know, so I've kind of used this phrase, you know, and the fact is that this time it's Austria. The private sector and the developed world are actually unwilling to voluntarily extend credit because they know that credit quality is very poor. Low interest rates do not actually allow you to risk, you know, risk, uh, uh, price risk properly in a portfolio. And I mean, here's an interesting anecdote, right? I had, a, I had a guy who used to work for me, actually the guy who first started the screens in 1995. And he's actually now working for SAP in Australia. And he, he, he phoned me the other day and he said, you know, uh, I'm trying to bid on this big house. And, uh, you know, I can go to the bank or I can go to you and I'd rather go to you. 
So I said, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, happy, to, uh, uh, I'm happy to finance you on this house. Uh, tell me what, the, what, what are the interest rates the bank is giving you. So, and, and tell me what the loan to value ratio is. And it turned out that the interest rate that the bank was giving them was actually 4.6%. And uh, the loan to value ratio was some crazy 80, 85 percent, you know. And I said to myself, I mean, so I said, Jesus, I mean, all these Australian banks for sure are going to go bust again, you know. So what I mean by that is when you have low interest rates, you're actually not creating the reserves that you require for, you know, those loans that are basically going to go belly up, right? You're not creating the, you know, the, the reserve, you're actually weakening your balance sheet. And if you're going to do it, you know, multiply it by, you know, uh, 100,000 times or whatever, you're actually virtually guaranteeing that, you know, you're basically going to go bust again, okay? And that's exactly what is happening. So in order to prevent massive defaults, in my opinion, ZERP needs to be maintained for the foreseeable future with diminishing effect and keeping asset prices high. They cannot do away with ZERP without causing massive defaults. At the first sign of a downturn, there's a rush for exit. So, you know, now we are no longer just in ZERP, right? We are in negative interest rate. I don't know what is the NZERP or something, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or NERP, negative interest rate policy. <laughs> and the point is that, you know, where's it going to end, right? I mean, the Swiss Central Bank basically went from minus 25, you know, 25 basis points to minus 75 basis points. And what do we expect next? You know, minus 2%, minus 5%. I mean, at what point in time do people just throw up their hands and say, well, forget about it. I'm just going to take my money and get out of here, you know. I'm going to put it on the mattress because for heaven's sake, at least under the mattress, <laughs> I'm not going to have a negative interest rate. Okay? So the point is that, you know, they cannot do away with ZERP because the minute they actually change ZERP, that's it. It's actually the whole game is over. And they cannot keep on giving more and more negative interest rates because at some point in time, people are going to basically revolt and say, okay, that's it. I'm not going to put my money in, in deposits. I have to pay you, you know, in order. And by the way, you know, even when they didn't have ZERP, any guy who puts his money in a bank in overseas, you know, you guys in India are actually, you don't know how lucky you are that you've got a, you've got a really good central banker. But any guy who puts his interest in deposits overseas, you actually are giving money to your bank to put your money in there because putatively they say that, oh, you're getting 0.1%, but guess what? They have this charge, that charge, this charge, that charge, custody charge, safekeeping charge, and you say, you think, hang on a second, you're not keeping my money safe, you know, why are you charging me to, <laughs> why are you charging me a safekeeping charge, you know? So the, so the point is that at the first time of a downturn, there's going to be a rush for the exits, okay? And so for economists with an Austrian perspective, 2008 was not a subprime crisis gone wild, but only the culmination of several flaws in the global monetary structure and various financial processes in their terminal place. Now, what's the first one? The flaw number one is an absence of sound money. And Austrians say, well, look, the lack of a pro proper global money at the base of the financial structure, well, by that we mean a commodity money, is really responsible for the buildup of fiduciary media beyond historical precedent. What we mean by fiduciary media is really just liabilities masquerading as money, you know. So you think about it, you know, when you have a checking account in the bank, you think, well, that's your money. But the reality is it's actually just a, uh, you know, you, you, the bank is a, in effect, you know, your debtor, okay. Uh, you know, it's, it's actually just a liability of the bank, uh, you know, matched against some asset, uh, probably to Eskimar Nationwide or something like that, you know. <laughs> So the point is that, you know, it's not a very nice, uh, you know, not a very nice situation. Central banks, you know, have hit the zero bound of a process targeting uh, or administering lower interest rates as a panacea for economic slowdown since 87. And they've actually had to resort to QE because they actually came to the zero bound, right? They kept on lowering interest rates. Every time the market sold off, they lowered interest rates and say, hey, presto, you know, this works, right? I mean, every time we lower interest rates, the market goes up. You know, and they kept on doing it until such time as, you know, they came to, oh, okay, now we are at zero, so what do we do now, right? And so then they came up with QE. To have some sort of semblance of a monetary policy to provide economic stimulus. So having resorted to QE, central banks are maintaining QE despite clear financial bubbles and economic dysfunction because, and, and Bejna pointed out, what do we mean by economic dysfunction? You know, is, is you know, the, the biotech, right? Where, you know, the companies don't even make money and, it's gone up by five times. Even Janet Yellen, by the way, realized that there was a bubble in biotechs, you know. I mean, she actually mentioned biotechs, you know, saying that, oh, yeah, okay, well, I think there is some bubble, and by the way, it's in biotechs, you know. <laughs> but it's contained. <laughs> so having resorted to QE, central banks are maintaining QE despite clear financial. 
And and the point is, I think you know, it's you know, in 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 the U.S., you have this sort of you know wonderful thing called a Roach Motel, right? I don't, I don't know. I think James will not like this very much, you know, but but they have this thing called Roach Motel, which is basically a kind of a house, and you know, the cockroaches go in there, and the minute they go in there, they kind of get stuck there, you know, and and unfortunately they die. But I mean, <laughs> the point is that that you know, uh, the tagline out there is you know, you can check in, but you can't check out, you know. And that's exactly what QE is, by the way. It's you can check in, but you can't check out. And the central bankers never worried about checking out. They just said, well, you know, we'll just keep on doing this until such time as, you know, it sorts itself out. Of course, it doesn't sort itself out. Uh, in August 14th, August 14th, 1971, Nixon abandoned the gold exchange standard and the world ushered in the old fiat money system. And the problem is that the absence of commodity money at the base of a monetary system means that Real savings does not equal real investment. I don't know how many of you guys did economics at at, at your university. You guys all do. You so you know how, how when you do economics and they, they tell you, oh, you know, real, you know, savings equals investment, right? I mean, they do they do they do this fancy sort of, you know, uh, GDP and you know C plus, you know, S and you know C S equals I kind of thing. Well, the fact is that that's true, but not in a financialized economy. In a financialized economy, real savings does not equal real investment. If you don't have commodity money, it actually doesn't equal, equal real investment. So in a world of dirty peg, floating, floating rate, and free of the gold standard, imbalances between countries can build up without any self-adjustment. And what it means is U.S. overconsumption, Chinese uh, overinvestment, or what we would call malinvestment. And again, I think this is a very important concept to understand because under the, under the old gold standard, what would happen is that if, if some country started consuming too much, more than their production beyond a certain level, they would actually start losing gold reserves. And since they had to maintain gold reserves, you know, to, uh, you know, for whatever credit they extended, in effect, what it would mean is that they had to actually start cutting back on the money supply. Okay, they had to start then switching back from consumption back to, you know, savings and back to investment, you know, from a domestic point of view. And ever since we broke that, that, that link, Effectively, you know, the U.S. have kept on issuing liability, they've kept on issuing bonds, and kept on issuing these liabilities, and all the rest of the world have been happy buying up these liabilities. Okay. Until, you know, it's like 4.5 trillion or, or, you know, in excess of 4.5 trillion, you know. And, and the fact is that these liabilities are not money good. I mean, just to, just to put it in perspective again, you know, U.S. US liabilities, government liabilities, is about 18 trillion right now, uh, which is equal to the GDP. But if you take, you know, what is the unfunded liabilities, you're talking about a number north of 55 trillion. Okay, so these are these are promises, entitlement promises that the U.S. government have made to their citizens about health care, social security, blah blah, all this kind of stuff, you know. And I can guarantee you, the U.S. government is not going to is not going to pay off on those 55 trillion of liability. So savings equals investment in normal terms, but the financial financialization of developed economies means it's not real savings, just the emission of producer media. Again, as I said, in Austrian terminology, it's liability is masquerading as money. And the ultimate backstop of this fiduciary media and fiat money is, you know, hence the global credit structure is actually the U.S. taxpayer German taxpayer. And I think I saw something in uh, one of the quotes that, Be uh, that Bejan had up there who actually made, made the same point, that really it was, you know, the, the, the entire credit structure of the world is in effect backed up by the U.S. taxpayer. And there's one thing I know about the U.S. taxpayer. You try and increase this tax rate by even 5% and there's going to be a reward, right? You might sort of throw all these guys into the into the Boston Harbor or something. You know, last time around they just threw tea. This time around they take the officials and throw them into the Boston Harbor. <laughs> they ain't gonna pay, you know, ten percent more, you know. So the real you know, so my point is the real value of these fiduciary media will need to be repriced versus real money once confidence in central bank is lost. And that's why I think, you know, what happened in, in, in the Swiss National Bank and the Swiss Euro is uh, very important because what it does is actually is the first nail in the coffin of you know confidence in central bank. What it tells you is that you absolutely cannot rely on central banks giving you any kind of commitment. So the Swiss National Bank, as recently as a week ago, promised that the peg was here to stay, right? And the point is that the minute that, you know people realize that hang on a second, we can't rely on the central bank. So all these promises that these guys have made, you know. We actually, you know, better take care of ourselves instead of relying on these guys to watch our back. You know, it's going to set up a whole bunch of stuff in, 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 in the economy. 
And and this is you know what I mean by the by the by you know by you know Ben, ben Bernanke has come up with another self-serving sort of uh, economic construct of the savings block, and you know in my opinion there's no such thing as a savings block. And and here's you know here's how I can graphically get demonstrated. So if you take the first S and D, you'll see out here. You'll see out here that this is where sort of equilibrium is at the natural rate. And at that natural rate, you basically have savers and investment, uh, savings and investment in balance. Uh, those guys who are saving, you know, the, the, the guys who want to invest, you know, they're in balance. And the central bank then starts lowering interest rates to sort of manipulate the stock market, you know, ergo 1987, and they actually create an imbalance, you know. So here is where uh, the fund demand is. And here is where actually the real savings is. Uh, and, and you can see there's already a sort of a gap building up. You know, and, and you can think of that as you know, uh, fiduciary media, you know, leverage, uh, whatever you want to call it, savings luck, you know, Bernanke calls it. And, uh, and, and then, the, you know, then the central bank does QE and they bring interest rates right down again. You know? And when they bring it right down again, what actually happens is you get a huge gulf. This is your real savings. And this is actually all the fiduciary media that's out there. The other way to think about it is that again, it's all the grocery media, man investments, you know, 600 million tons of steel uh, producers or whatever you will. <laughs> so, what is the possible catalyst for QE to end? Uh, paradoxically, if central banks declare victory and gradually end QE, uh, if there is a flow effect on that, and I guess if once people stop believing in you know, Bullard and Evans, and I think Bullard came on again, I think, you know, he came on on Friday, right, saying that. Uh, Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We're gonna we're, we're gonna bring on QE. Okay, so if it's a flow effect and, and 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 they stop this sort of front running or whatever, that's actually enough to reverse the process. The other possibility is that you know the demographics as it actually starts uh, exposing the absence of any tax or tax off. You know, and most of the entitlements are really a Ponzi scheme. I think this is increasingly becoming evident when you look at Japan. I mean, uh, Japan is a classic case where people are now recognizing widely that. Uh, you know, if Japan continues down this path, they're virtually bankrupt. And I think, you know, I, I honestly think uh, that I don't even I don't even understand what are the implications of a country like Japan going, you know, going bankrupt, right? I mean, what does it mean for the yen? What does it mean for, for you know, Toyota cars? You know, I, I have no idea. You know, I mean, I, it's sort of beyond my kind of understanding. You know, I mean, I mean, I'm not in Star Trek world of escape velocity. And then, of course, you know, policy in China reverses from unbridled credit, credit expansion, man investment, and stimulus to one with the long term in mind. And I think, you know, I've, I've just, again, I've not understood China because every every single time they sort of come out and say, oh, okay, we're going to rebalance the economy, we're going to stop this nonsense. And then, you know, the market, you know, I mean, and, and then, you know, the growth rate goes below 7%, and they come out, come out with another stimulus again. You know? So I've not really understood that. And, and so, again, you know, there's the other one is the political earthquake of 99% at election time. I, I think you guys know 2016 election. And then a whole bunch of geopolitical landmines, Russia, Ukraine, Middle East, and the impact on the So, will they or one day, the taper, will they one day? So, so what are the prospects of the national market? Where are the opportunities when you know them, right? I mean, as all the good investors, you want to know, okay, forget about all this doom and doom. Where am I going to make money out of it? This year? <laughs> and so the point is, you know, I think central banks have made credit appear safer than it really is. Central banks have suppressed volatility. You can virtually bank on enormous volatility. I mean, the Swiss franc one is just the first one of it. I think if one is long only, it's very hard, almost impossible to visualize earning an absolute return in the next five years. You know, I, and, and I think the best thing is, the best sort of signal to me is that, you know, you and we have had to start thinking about saying, well, we'll offer a long only product because we're not sure we can actually sell a long, long short product right now. Right? And so, you look at all these guys in the last five years, all the long short guys in the last five years, they've actually done absolutely abysmally. And they've not done abysmally because they've actually, you know, they're dumb investors. They've done abysmally because, you know, the central bankers have just basically rigged the game, you know, and they've rigged the game against, you know, what, what would be a sensible strategy for you. I think, by the way, investors will need to embrace long short strategies to have even a chance of earning an absolute result. Okay. And I think making positive returns would be all about investing with this enormous amount, which is why I'm very, very optimistic about you know, our business, because it's all about investing with this enormous amount. And, and, and then lastly, I think asset classes will behave idiosyncratically and not as they've done historically since the first quarter or whatever.
What I mean by that is that if you think your deposit is actually safe, it turns out your deposit could be actually, you know, uh, uh, a lot more risky than buying Netflix shares or, or, or you know, some you know, good share. And the reason I say that is because if you look at Cyprus where basically deposits are wiped out, you know, the chances are that if you actually have some equity somewhere, you actually at least retain some kind of that. So asset classes are not going to behave like all these wealth managers who keep on sending you the thing, oh, you know, high risk and high return and, you know, low risk and low return kind of thing. And this is not the, you're actually going to end up in situations where you're actually taking high risk for low returns and low risk for high returns. So let's just have a quick look at the implications for asset classes. You know, uh, cash, the high, you know, if you look at, you know, if you look at, if you think about it in the top risk portfolio terms, then, you know, the highest quality cash asset is gold. Why is gold? The highest quality is basically the only monetary asset that's no one's value. In 3,000 years of history, it, it actually has served as money. It's no one else's liability. And I think, as all the quotes that Alan Greenspan sort of, uh, you know, um, that Bajan presented, it really is, in my opinion, the currency par excellence. If you look at bonds, you want to make sure your bonds, you know, are net creditors of, of sovereigns or corporates. And I think the analogy in India would be that we would want to make absolutely sure. That you're holding bonds of companies that are actually providing a useful service, right? So, you know, I mean, in my opinion, if you hold a, uh, an Andhra Bank uh, deposit, chances are you're going to be, you know, much more at risk than if you own, let's say, a power grid uh, bond, you know, I, 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 or a railway bond, for example, right? I mean, you know that, you know, come what may, the railways are going to have to uh, function, you know. But does Andhra Bank need to function? I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, you can wipe out the equity, and it's not going to create a systemic problem. Uh, in terms of equity, you know, we would say that you want to basically own only high quality equity. And again, I mean sound business models and, and, and you know, I mean, I don't know, I, I don't know whether I want to have 60% of my portfolio in Astro or Party or whatever. It might be a perfectly good company, but <laughs> I'm not sure about it. And then in terms of real estate, you want to have location, location, location. But I think, you know, in order to be safe, you need to be at the highest quality end of each active class that if you're a long only investor, and actually that portfolio declines relatively. And by the way, if everything goes down by 99% and your portfolio goes down by 50%, guess what? You've actually done really well. Because ultimately, the reason why we actually invest money is that we want to preserve our consumption far over the long term, right? And so, you know, if everything goes down by 99% and, you know, whatever asset you invest in only goes down by 50%, you actually come out 40, 49% ahead. So, you know, for those guys who want to know, well, what does all this mean for, you know, me sitting in India? You may rab it on about the global thing, but, you know, what the hell do I care? I'm in India, I'm getting 8% of my deposit, you know. And in India, there's sort of both bad news and good news. You know. The bad news is the bad news is actually likely to come first before the good news. And, and this is really one of the problems that I think we've sort of pointed out, is that financial savings and the percent of total savings has actually really gone down, okay? And, and, and that has been because in my opinion, you know, the governments have basically run negative real, real interest rates and stuff like that. Obviously, that's changed in the recent two years. We haven't yet seen a turnaround, but, you know, I, I, I do think that there may well be a turnaround, but I think we want you to look at this very closely. Because if it doesn't actually start turning around, what it will tell me is that, you know, Mr. Modi can talk about, you know, all the things until the cows come home, but it's not actually going to, you know, happen. And again, you know, if you look at new capex, you know, the fact is that new capex is the percent of GDP one of the lowest uh, points available in history. And again, you know, I would look at this very, very closely to see that, okay, is there something really changing on the ground? And this is what I meant, you know, about the credit structure of India. So if you look at all the PSU banks, and you know, this is this is one of the things that is kind of difficult to, you know, get across. Uh, in fact, we had a conversation with one of the clients who had actually, you know, a position in the PSU bank. And uh, I said, listen, you know, you know, it might look optically cheap, but guess what? It's actually a lot more expensive than even HDFC bank. Right? And 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 the point is, if you take the market price and you actually take all the stress assets, and you say, well, let's just wipe out 100% to be on the safe side, right? I mean, okay, you can turn around and say, well, maybe not 100%, maybe you should do 50%, whatever. But I think, you know, to be to be a good sort of margin of safety match, you say, well, let's wipe out all this sort of stuff, and you see that Andhra Bank is bust, right? And Central Bank is bust, and IOB is bust, and United Bank is bust, and Yuko Bank is bust. And how many guys, by the way, is there any one of you has an account at any of these banks? 
Okay, you all, you all very smart guys. Except the cast. <laughs> Which one do you have a bank in? Uh, which one have a deposit? Indian bank. Indian, Indian, well, Indian bank is not bought, right? Yeah. IOB is bought. I'm half <laughs> So, where do you. Well, State Bank of India is not boxed. It's still got it's still three times. It just, it just happens to be trading at an astronomical valuation. Uh, but my point is that if there's anyone who has their money in their bank, in those in those banks, I guarantee you that what they're thinking is, hang on a second, the Indian government is going to bail these banks out. I mean, for heaven's sake, they bail out SpiceJet, right? And what's SpiceJet? You know, what is systematically important about SpiceJet? And then of course they have this Gyan Sangam and they say, oh, by the way, we're not going to interfere with you guys, you know, you can make all your decisions. And then the next day they go to another, by the way, give 100 crores to Spicer. <laughs> <laughs> My point is the, the biggest problem in India, I think, is that the Indian government is actually backstopping the entire credit structure of the country. And that's a big, big issue because frankly, the Indian government is simply not big enough to backstop the entire credit structure of the country. And there's one of two things that you, you know I can I can tell you with certainty. If they try and backstop the entire credit structure of this country, I can guarantee you the rupee is going to be at 120. It's going to be like the ruble, right? It'll go from 33 to 163 uh, or whatever. It's going to go from 63 to 120. So all those guys, you know, uh, I mean, Mandar was telling you, oh, by the way, Prashant then thinks you know gold is uh, useless instrument or whatever. Charlie Munger thinks you know you're a buying gold. I can guarantee you, the Indian government keeps on trying to back the credit structure of this entire country, the rupee is going to go to 100 grand. So, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, the guys who thought, that, you know, believe the Swiss National Bank lost a lot of money, right? I mean, F FXCM lost $200 million in one day. And they had Lucadia, which is, you know, by the way, my a very interesting article in Zero Head, which said that, you know, Lucadia, which is actually a subprime. Uh, subprime issuer of bonds actually goes and bails them out. You know? <laughs> so my, my point is that you know uh, if the Swiss National Bank cannot be relied on, I can tell you something. You know I can tell you for sure that you cannot rely on you know the government of India coming in and bailing all these institutions out when there's really really huge stress in the market. So the positive of the way. But the good news is that India is the largest private holder of gold stock in the world. And if gold gets repriced, the real wealth effect and relative boost in purchasing power consumption to the rest of the world will actually be material and significant. I actually think this is the one thing that's going to save India. That when gold gets repriced, you'll suddenly find that people in India are worth, on a per capita basis, more than people in the US. <laughs> and who would have thought that that would actually happen in the next 10 years? But take it from me, it's actually going to happen in the next 10 years. I'm not going to have to wait until 105 you know, in order to excuse. So, unless you think I'm a raving lunatic, you know, here are some other money manager quotes. You know, so, John Huston, I've still kept it on. You know, Fed induced speculation does not create wealth, it only changes the profile of returns over time. It redistributes wealth away from investors who are enticed to buy rich valuations and hold the bag, and redistributes wealth towards a handful of investors who are fortunate and wise enough. We sell at rich valuations and wait for better offers. Uh, with so much dry kindling, it will not take much to spot the next conflagration. Central banking has lost its way. Trapped in a post crisis quagmire of zero interest rates and stolen balance sheets, the world's major central banks do not have an effective strategy for regaining control over financial markets. Central banks should normalize crisis and use policies as soon as possible. Financial markets will, of course, affect our And that's Stephen Roche. And by the way, who remembers? Stephen Roche used to be Morgan Stanley, right? Of course, when he was with Morgan Stanley, he never would say any of these things. <laughs> but now he's a professor at Yale, so he can sort of say this. And, and again, I've kept Jeremy Grantham because, you know, I think he's absolutely right. The next bus will be unlike any other. Over the next seven years, we think the market will have negative return. The next bus will be unlike any other because the Federal and the central, other central banks around the world have taken on all these very reserves out there, put it on their balance sheet. We've never had this before. And of course, you know, the famous Alan Greenspan, that first tapering discussion, we got a very strong market response. Remember, tapering is still slowing the rate of increase. We're still increasing the balance sheet. Just the discussion of lowering the rate of increase on the balance sheet crashes the market. Yeah. This is exactly what I said about floor stock effect. 
And on gold, it is still by all evidences the premier currency where no fiat currency, including dollar, can match it. But it's also got monetary characteristics, which is intrinsic, is not inbred into human beings. I cannot conceive of any mechanism by which you could say that, but it behaves as well. And, you know, this is Alan Greenspan, as, as, as Bernard said. I, I think, you know, what, what happens is that if you are in the Echoes building, which actually houses the Fed, there's something in the water that actually, you know, kind of makes your brain go crazy. <laughs> so the minute you get out of it, you know, you're actually normal. And of course, you know, this is uh, Mark Twain. We started with Mark Twain to have ended it. October is the two months, completely a dangerous month to speculate in stocks. The others are July, January, September, April, March, November, May, March, June, December, August, and February. Uh, I just want to sort of uh, conclude with a few quick comments. Uh, a lot of people have said, well, you know, there's no inflation, there's blah, blah, all this kind of stuff. Let me tell you, the, the, all the inflation is actually bottled up in the government bond market. There's a very important comment quote that Bernard put in, which is by the Peter Wobin. And by the way, you know, I'm actually a subscriber to his service called Halkin. He's, he's, he's actually quite an astute guy. Uh, who said that basically financial repression depends upon people being fooled into thinking that government government bonds are a safe asset. Okay, and that and, and that's exactly right. right. So all the inflation in the world right now is bottled up in the bond market. And the minute that inflation actually starts getting released, when I when I say inflation, I mean it starts going out of the government bond markets, it's actually gonna start getting into we're gonna start seeing huge inflation. And I suspect what's gonna happen is that money is going to start moving out. I mean, by the way, it's always a misnomer to say money, money is moving out. What, what it means is that one asset, you know, just starts rapidly declining and the other starts sort of rapidly increasing. But effectively, you know, money is going to start moving out of these bond markets into actually real assets. And when I say real assets, I mean gold, I mean iron ore, I mean oil, I mean all these kind of, you know, commodities which are absolutely hammered right now. Actually, the inflation that is stored up in the government bond market is actually going to start getting released into that market. And when that starts happening, it's basically game over for the Fed. Okay, it's game over for all the central banks. So, uh, and the reason I say that is very simple is because would you rather have a financial claim on a financial claim on a financial claim on a financial claim, or would you rather have a financial claim on a real asset? That's it. There are no other financial claim than financial claim than financial claim. I mean, I don't know whether you know, but Standard Chartered, when it turns out Standard Chartered lost some billions of dollars in uh, recently because of these oil hedges or something. I mean, I didn't even know Standard Chartered had an oil business, right? What the hell are they doing, you know, messing around in oil derivatives, for heaven's sake? They're the basic, simple bank. And they even got rid of all their, you know, they closed all their, uh, their trading departments and all that, you know. Sorry? Yeah, they closed their equity. And they're messing around in oil derivatives? So the, the point is that, you know, the problem is that you actually have just no idea what's on the asset side of all these liabilities, financial liabilities, okay? And, and that's the real problem. So I think the sensible investor is going to actually try and get a financial claim on a real asset rather than on a financial claim on a financial claim on a financial claim. And you can, you know, multiply that by, you know, infinity, okay?